Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the structure of the uh, Glucial channel. So, now that we've discussed the structure of the Glucial channel, we're going to move on to uh, drugs which interact with it. We've seen uh, this 1-palmitoyl, 2-oleoyl, SN, uh, glycero 3 phosphocholine this POPC molecule. We've also talked about glutamate, the normal agonist for this Glucial channel. We're now going to talk about the anti-helminth drug. Uh, ivermectin, and this is a drug which is used clinically both in uh, human medicine and veterinary medicine. So the anti-helminth drug, and it's called ivermectin, okay? So, ivermectin is often abbreviated to IVM for short, okay? And we're now going to look at what it actually does to the glucial channel and why it can be used to kill uh, parasitic worms. Okay, right, so ivermectin is going to bind to the gluciel channel and it's going to cause it to open, just, just like POPC caused it to open. Although we'll see that the way that POPC changes the conformation of the gluciel channel is very different from the way that ivermectin changes the conformation of the gluciel channel. It also binds in a different site to uh, POPC. So we see that POPC binds between the two M2 alpha helices here. Now, I, it, ivermectin doesn't bind there. It binds here, basically. This is the binding site of ivermectin. So I'll just label this up with IVM for ivermectin. So ivermectin binds more peripherally, more peripherally, it binds to the outer leaflet of the glucial channel rather than the inner leaflet, okay? And it too is a partial agonist for this receptor, so it will cause it to open. Right, so let's just discuss the changes that both of these drugs, POPC and ivermectin, have on uh, the um, channel, how they actually cause it to open. Well, basically, when POPC binds, what you see is that all of the M2 alpha helices move backwards. They all move outwards. Now, basically, in the initial state, when you've got no drug bound, all the alpha helices are pretty much straight. So these five alpha helices are pretty erect and uh, straight, and effectively the pore through the middle is like a straight pore. Okay, so there's no sort of um, there's no sort of crevices inwards. It's if I draw a picture, basically if you look at the pore uh, before anything has bound, it's very narrow, but it's straight. So it's like this. It is not like this, basically, is what I'm trying to say. It is a straight pore. So this is before anything has bound. So this is in the uh, closed resting state. Okay? Now, when it goes into the open state under the influence of uh, POPC, so what POPC does is it just causes the pore to become wider. Okay? So, the pore remains very, very much so straight, but becomes wider. This means that these hydrophobic girdles at the 9 prime, uh, nine prime amino acids and also the, um, the gates that we have at the 2 prime uh, amino acids and also at the negative 2 prime, uh, they're all pulled outwards, basically, and there will be now a gap through the middle through which chloride anions can move. The way that ivermectin opens the channel is very different. Basically, it does bring them out a little bit, but it takes them far more to something that looks like this, actually. So what happens is you get this large sort of crevice in the middle. The M2 alpha helices sort of kink like so, and that also helps the channel to open. Because if you think about it, this will be the position of that 9 prime hydrophobic girdle, which even though we've said that there are two other ones, the uh, threonine at 2 prime and the proline at negative 2 prime, the leucine at 9 prime is the most important. So you can see that the leucines will be pulled out the way. They'll be back here basically now, and you've got a nice big gap through which chloride anions can move. So, um, 
basically the way that the two drugs affect the channel is different. That's my message through this. Uh, POPC will cause the whole pore to get larger, but they remain nice and straight. Whereas ivermectin opens the channel in a different way. So basically there's not just one open state, it's more complicated than that. Finally, I'll also just say something about desensitization, the closed desensitized state. What's believed to happen there is that the channel closes even more than it was in the closed resting state, so it crumples down to an even smaller level, but very little is understood about the closed desensitized state. So, this is the effect of ivermectin when it binds to the gluteal channel. It will cause it to open. So you will now get chloride anions coming into the uh, cell, basically. So, let's discuss why that is going to kill um, worms, why it's going to kill parasitic worms. Well, basically, these parasitic worms, believe it or not, they actually have their own little nervous systems, and they also have muscle, which is innervated by the nerves. And these neurons have... Um, have these gluteal channels within them, which are allowing chloride anions into the neurons, okay? Now, if we give ivermectin to someone, then what's going to happen is it's going to get into the parasitic worm, and what it's going to do is it's going to bind to the gluteal channel, and it's going to cause that gluteal channel to open. Now, if the gluteal channel opens, then that's going to allow too much chloride to come into the neurons of the uh, parasitic worm or other creature. We'll see we're also going to use it to treat head lice, which aren't a worm at all, they're an arthropod. Okay, um, so it's going to cause too much chloride to go into those neurons and all the neurons are basically going to become over inhibited because if chloride enters the cytoplasm of the cell, then it lowers the electrical potential of the cytoplasm of the cell and that hyperpolarizes the neurons so they can't be excited. So basically, you're going to get huge dysfunction of the nervous system. You're also going to therefore get dysfunction of the muscular system because the muscular system uh, is controlled by the nervous system and that's what's going to kill uh, the parasitic worm. Okay, so what do we actually use ivermectin to treat in humans? Okay, so the first thing to say is that we use it to treat head lice. So head lice are a form of arthropod, okay? And basically we put ivermectin in shampoos that are specifically targeted against head lice. So what happens is when you, uh, when you um, rub the shampoo into your hair, Ivermectin will be going all over these little head lice and it will be binding to their gluteal 1 channels and causing over inhibition of their neurons basically and that will uh, cause dysfunction of the muscular system and the nervous system and um, it's bye bye for the head lice. Okay, another disease that we use, uh, ivermectin, and this is the main use of ivermectin in clinical medicine because we have other better drugs against head lice. Uh, one of the main things it's used for is onchocerciasis. Okay, so let me uh, talk to you about this. Okay, so onchocerciasis, which I'll put up here. So onchocerciasis. Okay, onchocerciasis or river blindness is caused by a parasitic worm known as Onchocerca volovilus. And I'll just briefly give you a little bit um, of insight into the life cycle of Onchocerca volovilus. Okay, and we're going to use ivermectin to treat it. So onchocerciasis is caused by a worm, a parasitic worm, which has the name Onco. Circa volovilus. Volovilus. Okay, so basically, in uh, certain countries of the world, uh, you have a fly. Okay, so basically, onchocerciasis is uh, spread by flies. So it's like malaria, which is spread by an insect. Um, so it's not spread by mosquitoes, however, it's spread by some flies. So here, is our bad guy. This is our fly here. Okay, and this is a specific type of fly. So here's our fly's legs. 
It's a fly known as a black fly. Now, what's going to happen is this black fly is going to irresponsibly get itself infected with Onchocercovolvulus. Okay, and we'll see how it gets infected. We'll see the cycle, basically. It gets infected, it infects the human, and the human infects it, basically. So, um, it's infected with Onchocercovolvulus. And basically, what it's going to do is it's going to come and bite the human to take a blood meal. So here comes our human. Okay. And the black fly decides that the human looks rather tasty. So it goes and bites the human. Okay. And when it bites the human and takes some blood, what will happen is it will leave Onchocercovoluvuli larvae in the skin of the human. Okay. So then what happens is these larvae grow up into adult Onchocercovolvulus. Okay, so they become adults. And what happens is these are a massive great worm. Well, they're not a massive great worm. But they are a big worm that will be sitting in the... Uh, oh, goodness, what am I drawing? Get rid of that. So they are a worm. Okay, I'll just draw a single line. So they're a worm which will sit in the skin. And basically, this worm is palpatable. Basically, what you will find is that in your skin, you will have large subcutaneous nodules. So subcutaneous means that they are under the skin. They are under the epidermis and the dermis. So remember, you have uh, multiple layers of the skin. You have the epidermis, the outer layer, which is uh, consists of five separate little layers. But effectively, that's the layer that makes you waterproof. And then underneath you have another layer known as the dermis, okay? And this contains things like your sweat glands, it contains the blood vessels, it contains the sebaceous glands, the hair follicles, the sensory apparatus, so the parskisian corpuscles or something like that. Um, and then underneath that you'll have subcutaneous fat. And in this subcutaneous fat region here, we have the Onchocercovolvulus adult sitting there. And basically this will form such a big lump that it's palpatable from the outside and it will form what's known as a subcutaneous nodule. Subcutaneous nodule. Okay, right. Now, um, that's not very nice. You can actually feel these subcutaneous nodules and what will now happen to make matters worse for you is this adult will start releasing babies, basically. It will start producing microfilariae, okay? So it will produce microfilariae, okay? And then what will happen is another black fly will come and bite your skin. And when it bites your skin, it will take in some of these microfilariae and those microfilaria will develop and infest the black fly so that now that black fly is, in, is infected with Onchocercovolvulus. It will then produce larvae within it, which can then go back to the human. So that's the sort of parasitic life cycle of Onchocercovolvulus. Okay, right. Now, uh, why does this cause blindness? Why does this cause river blindness? Well, basically, what will happen is this will, if this, if this happens in the cornea of your eye, okay, then what you get is inflammation of the cornea, and you gradually get keratinization of the cornea, and it becomes thicker and thicker and less and less translucent, more opaque, and that means that you become blind. So remember, if I just remind you of the structure of the eye, then what you have here is the lens, okay? Here is the um, pupil surrounding the lens. Okay. Oh, actually, no, that's not that's not right. Let me draw this again. So, <laughs> I've also called the iris the pupil. No, this is what happens when you don't prepare for this portion of the talk. Right. So here's the pupil. Here are the suspensory filaments with the um, with the lens here. Okay. So these are the suspensory ligaments. Okay, and then round the back, what you have is the retina. So this is the eye. And then over the top here, you have the cornea. Okay, so this is the cornea here. This is the iris. Okay, these are the suspensory ligaments here. 
also known as the zonule of zin, suspensory ligaments. Okay. And this is the lens here. And at the back, we have the retina of the eye over here. So, if this process of um, producing microfilariae, if some of the microfilariae uh, end up in the cornea, what will happen is the uh, body will launch an immune response against those microfilariae. And I want to stress that, you know, these microfilariae that the uh, adult oncocircovolvulus is producing, they're not just limited to the skin around uh, that oncocircovolvulus. They will go into the lymphatics from here, they'll then get into the bloodstream and they can get end up all over the place. So if they end up in the cornea, what will happen is you'll launch an immune response against them and this will lead to the thickening of the cornea. Okay, it will lead to the keratinization of the cornea and there shouldn't be keratin in the cornea. Well, there's, there's a tiny layer of it, but um, it's mainly made up of very ordered collagen, so that it's actually a translucent layer. Okay, but when you thicken the cornea up with uh, keratin, then what's going to happen is the cornea is going to become opaque and you're not going to be able to see out of it anymore. And that's why it leads to blindness. So that's why this onchocerciasis, uh, which is this infection with onchocercovolvulus, um, leads to uh, river blindness.